So, um, my name is Marty Cole. I'm the director of uh, features and services for Sirius XM Radio. Um, a lot of people ask exactly what that. Basically, it means that I'm the UX director. My team is responsible for building all the features and services that are shared across the entire Sirius XM family, whether you're in a car, in streaming, you know, the, anything that runs across the full gamut of the, of the product. Then usually what will happen is we'll help design it, do the features and services, and then we hand it off to another team of UX designers that work specifically. If you've ever been in with the OEMs, you can see how Sirius XM in a Ford is slightly different than it is Sirius XM in a Mercedes. So they work with those specific OEM teams to make sure that the product's implemented properly. So that's what I do. Great. Um, Alexis? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Alexis Puchek. I'm a principal director of design at a company called Frog. Um, what I do is I am the US interaction design practice lead. So Austin, New York, San Francisco, and Mexico City. Uh, I also run teams as a creative director in our Austin studio. Uh, and I also run our internship program for Austin. Uh, like Cindy, I'm a teacher. I teach at ACC, um, survey of UX design in their UX UI degree program. Great to meet y'all. And William? Hey guys. All right, so I'm William and Tim. Um, I used to be at Home Depot as of Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and then I transitioned uh, into a new role at Skill Factor um, as a senior product designer. So I used to be a senior UX designer at Home Depot, um, serving, uh, servicing the B2B order management uh, pro customers for Home Depot. So there's, you know, there's two sides, direct to consumer, and then you have professionals, contractors, builders, et cetera. So that's the side of the, side of the business that I was uh, designing for. Uh, but now I'm here at Skill Factor and we're building, um, it's an account and software as a service uh, platform that services small businesses, medium-sized, large businesses. So you're dealing with complex data and, you know, um, algorithms, et cetera. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. But today is actually my first day here at Skill Factor. So you guys are like in the mix in real time. But yeah, great to be here. Great to have you, um, all of you. Um, I think Amanda is going to start uh, with the first question. You can go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, so just to preface this, I mean, this meetup is how to keep your UX career future forward. I know with the advent of an artificial intelligence and, you know, technology always changing and developing, um, a lot of people are always concerned about how to keep their career up to date and current. So to start us off, I'd like to ask, how have changes affected your career in technology and how should I uh, expect them to affect my career moving forward? And if that can even be predicted. If you guys wanna hop in and <laughs> just take turns giving your point of view, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I can take a stab at this one, I guess. Um, so I, the way I look at this, I see it twofold. Um, one is around the discipline itself and then the other is around technology. So when I started, there was not a thing called user experience design or information architecture or interaction design. Um, I was a front end web developer. Um, and so I think as designers, we need to one, be able to proactively move ebb and flow with how our titles will change. I think inherently we're all going to be doing relatively similar tasks as we continue forward in the future. Um, we are problem solvers. And so that's what we need to make sure that we focus on, regardless of whether that problem is around a product or a service or a digital experience uh, or a web app or anything else. I would say on the, the flip side with, in terms of technology, um, at least at Frog, the way that we like to talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, emerging technologies, things like that, is around how we can see those technologies empowering us as people, as humans, as designers, as workers, um, and not, not necessarily taking the route or the, the fear of will robots or artificial intelligence like one day take my job. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of great intelligence that artificial intelligence can infuse into any solution that we create 
Um, but inherently the empathy and the problem solving and the creativity that we bring is necessary from a, an actual human to create solutions for other people. Um, so I think as long as we are taking that approach of, of how we continue to learn, um, embrace technology uh, and bolster our skill sets, and I'll just say that in a broad way, um, we'll, be, we'll be just fine. Um, so I can I can I can go next. Um, one of the things that um, I always hear when you know when you're talking about the the AI and the concerns is that as designers, what we're designing is how are we going to interact with that artificial intelligence? It's not that it's taking our job. We're, we're not going where it's humans, and there will be an interface that we will interact with the AI. And that's my cat. Tell him thank you. Because it's important he had to get <laughs> had to join in the, uh, the anyway the but that interaction becomes you know before we interacted with screens and back-end databases and now it's just another system on the back end that we're interacting with i don't believe our value i as alex said as problems alexa said as problem solvers is going to go anywhere because in fact as more and more of these devices become available and look at the wide range, it used to be just your phone or computer. Now it's gonna be your refrigerator and your doorbell and your car and all these other things. All those systems are gonna require really solid user experience designers to solve those problems and interact with those systems. So no, I think, I think we're just at the beginning of this. By no means do I think that, that our careers are going anywhere. I think we're gonna be in demand for years and years. <laughs> I agree with what uh, Marty and Alexis have said. Um, you know, going back to really the basics of our entire roles as designers is the human-centered design aspect, right? So mastering that art of human design, you know, human perspective and always approaching our design, um, I guess, responsibilities with that human perspective is really how, you know, I've, you know, gone with you know with the wave um through all these years right up to this point because as alexa said the titles have changed you know we were web developers well web designers at one point and then you know became fun developers and this and that so um always going back to the basics understanding you're designing for humans and then looking at it from a human perspective throughout every step of that design process uh, because technologies are going to change tools are going to change um, but the user mostly is, you know, him, you know, is us, right? Human. So um, if you can really understand the perspective of a human and figure out how that interacts, uh, interacts with, a, you know, with the device, with an interface or uh, a product, then your, you know, competitive advantage is actually higher than someone who's, you know, more fixated on, okay, well, I'm a uh, specialized in one aspect of the discipline, but I always go back to the basics of and centeredness. I think that's that's key. Can I jump in and ask you a question? This is Cindy. Um, so I, you guys said something that was really, this kind of struck me because you know I, when I started, I was a web designer, and I think when I realized I was a UX designer, I was actually a little bit late to the game, <laughs> honestly, in like saying, this is what I do, even though I've been doing it all along. When did you all realize that things were evolving during your careers? How did you, and how did you react? Like what, what, what was that? How, how did you stay kind of on top of the things as things are changing? Was it because you were looking for new jobs and all of a sudden you saw the role names were changing like what was that change and maybe if we want to start uh william or or alexis or marty any of you if you want to start off with that yeah i'll jump in so i feel like with with mine uh i remember this moment in an elevator uh it was after a uh, uh, university college uh career day or something um and one of the employers were was hiring for a ui designer so you know I was a graphic designer, you know, I had a graphic design, visual communication degree. So, uh, you know, I went up to him and I was like, oh, hey, you know, I'm ready. I can do the job. You know, here's my resume. I had like two years at that point. 
And, you know, he said, oh, have you done like mobile design? You know, I'm like, what do you mean mobile design? <laughs> you know, and he said like design for an app. And I'm like, no, I haven't. Uh, but I can, I mean, I could do it. I could do anything. I'm a, I'm a designer. Like, I, of course I can design for an app. I could design for anything. He's like, no, we're looking for somebody who's been doing, you know, mobile design. And I thought to myself, what the heck do you mean mobile design? Like no one is just designing for mobile phones, you know? And at that time it was really early, but long story short, he said no. And I was really crushed, right? I was like, ah. so it made me more curious about this new terminology going on of like, oh, UI design, like what is that? And then uh, digging deeper, I realized, wait, but I've been building websites and, uh, you know, uh, focusing on conversion for these clients of mine and focusing on, you know, user behavior, et cetera. So I'm thinking, I've been doing this the whole time, right? But um, being being aware of that title change and, you know, that uh, process and, and the documentation and all that, you know, uh, everything surrounding the discipline was uh, eye-opening to really start morphing myself and using the right process, the right terminology and uh, Brandon to understand, okay, I'm actually a U, you know, UX designer um, because I'm, I'm designing for the digital web and mar uh, marrying that with human behavior as I do that. So that was my moment, yeah. Yeah, I can jump in and, oh, go ahead, Marty. No, I'll let you go first. All right, that sounds great. Um, so, I mean, I first want to establish, like, I started this thing, like, 17 years ago. So, um, I've, I've got some time on y'all, I'm sure. Um, so, my world was just different back then. Um, I started as a front-end web developer and designer. And what that meant was that I did all the things. I did visual design, interaction design, user experience design, information architecture, uh, front-end web development, uh, accessibility testing, and it was just bananas. Um, and I think there are many generalists out there that still do all these things, typically at smaller companies, um, but that was at like a Fortune 50 like visa. Um, after about five years there doing that job, uh, I really fell in love with aspects of uncovering layout and structure and, and creating order to things um, beyond just building them and making them function. And when I, uh, when I ended up leaving Visa and I went to a company called PayPal, um, it, I was kind of blessed, I guess, in the fact that like they had already begun to silo their disciplines. So I became an interaction designer for the first time out of front end web development they still had development, but it was very much geared towards engineering. So you can be a front end developer or a back end developer, a visual designer, a content writer, a researcher, or a, an interaction designer. Um, and some of the people who, who came to PayPal with me um, were, were hiring for the role. And they were like, I know that you're, you're a UX designer, so we're gonna put you in that role. And, and that just worked out really well for me. Um, it was everything that I wanted and everything that I loved about the job that I was doing before. And what I think is really great about having a well-rounded skill set like a generalist or like a front-end web developer is it gives you, as you consider the ways in which you pivot your career or potentially focus what discipline you want to work in, it allows you to become a T-shaped designer. And I'm not sure if, if everyone's heard of that, but it, it means that you really have a strong pillar around your discipline. So for me, that's like literally everything under the sun that is user experience design. And then I have a crossbar that gives me other comparable skills that I don't necessarily use in my day to day, but allow me to have really well-versed conversations, have empathy for other people of where they're coming from, like visual design or development uh, or anything else. And it doesn't mean that I have to be a, an expert visual designer and an expert developer and an exer, expert user experience designer because it's it's nearly impossible from my perspective to be a master in all of those things so that's why i love being a t-shaped designer because i can be a master in all things user experience design and like know enough about the other stuff to talk to people but i don't have to split my time across five different disciplines trying to learn five different technologies and five different design tools and five different ways to do whatever um so that's how i've been able to grow and again like you know hashtag blessed right like I, like my company kind of moved me in the direction for me um at that time and then i just doubled down on it and then learned everything i could about 
the discipline um, and as, as I grew into more senior roles in the discipline. I will have to condense my story because it's really long. Just you guys. Just yeah, we have time. No, seriously, go designer. for it. I was a designer when there was no Macintosh. So let's just go back in time through that. Let's do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, 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 so actually, I saw a Mac, I had gone through traditional art school and I saw a Macintosh change fonts on the screen and like an old version of McPaint and like rainbows, unicorns danced. It was a magical thing. And I, and at that time, you guys don't remember computers were phenomenally expensive and I couldn't possibly afford one. So I talked to guys at the local computer store into hiring me as a salesman. So I hung out with computer geeks and they taught me everything that I needed to know. That was how I got moved from graphic design into computers. After that, then it became kind of a snowball thing. I worked for a while with, uh, for a company called Aldis that merged with Adobe and, and then I was doing work because everything was print design at that point. And one of my clients at the, in 1996 at the MGM said, oh, you're that computer graphics person. We need a website. We don't know what that is, but they told us we have to have one. So go build it. And I went, okay. And that was when I learned how to code because you had to. <laughs> it, was like, it was like the medium you worked in. There wasn't anybody to help you. And I was fortunate in the sense that my career, I just kept building on the things. And in the process of doing that, um, then I ended up, ended up working at realtor.com. I was the creative director at Travelocity for a number of years. And what you learn as you grow up is, is a lot of this, not only becoming a T-shaped person, but what you like and what you don't like. Like I love the results of user research. I learned, I hate doing it. I, I, I hate, I, it's like three times, about the third time I walk them through, I'm going, please, I'm so bored. Just get, you know, give me the, and I'm, um, I have friends, Levi, the guys who work with me, they love it. They're, you know, they're all into it. And I just, it's not my thing. I, I, I appreciate it, but I understood one of the joys about being a generalist is you can kind of look at where are you? Are you a, you know, are you a visual designer? Do you really love presentation layer code? Do you really love interaction design? Do you really love information architecture and flowcharts and diagramming and all that, you know, all that stuff? And you can figure out where you belong, like to make yourself that T-shaped person, but don't be afraid to do that because, and go with what's in your heart and what you love and where, where you, and you, cause you'll know where your strengths are. Don't, if you try to force yourself into something where you just don't like it, like me with research, you'll end up, I, like I said, I want all the results. I just don't want to, I just don't like doing it. I was so thrilled to hear you say T-shaped designer. Cause I literally taught that. <laughs> in class <laughs> but the importance of being a t-shaped designer but i mean you know there's a couple different ways to go after it and like honestly marty you brought up one way and alexis you brought up one way and i think i'm kind of the the generalist i've done front-end development and i've done graphic design and i've done all the little things and i'm really starting i'm really trying to dive deep into ux design but i know in the other way you could be a t-shaped is if you're a ux design generalist and then you dive deep into like interaction or or research are they are we limiting ourselves if we're just you know really focused on ux should we for you know go out a little bit beyond ux into anything else it, will that help with keeping the career future forward what are your thoughts on that Well, you still have, no matter what you do in this, you have to talk to stakeholders and you have to know about things like RLIs and, and because these are real issues and they're not just, you know, it's all about, you know, it's not, yes, it's absolutely about the user and your customer, but you have to keep those things in perspective. So being able to convert and understand when you talk to your product managers and um, really what's driving them and will help you get through a lot of conversations because you have to, you have your solution, but you have to sell it. And you have to look at their priorities and stuff in context. So knowing, uh, uh, being aware of true business processes and what these people do and, the, and how things are measured and analytics, all those things will make a huge difference in being, in your being able to get through. Um, and most importantly, we'll get to in probably a minute is, is the ability to communicate your idea quickly and effectively because, you know, I don't, I'm not making fun of product managers are here, but they don't usually have really long attention spans. 
you're going to have to get in there and get the idea and get them pitched and then and then and, and get them hooked. And to be able to do that, you need to understand. You need to be able. They're users too. Look at it from their point of view. Where are they coming from? What do they need? And give it to them. William, do you want to go or do you want me to go? Uh, you could go. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I think it's an interesting question, Cindy, and I think it really just depends on where you want to go in your career and the companies that you're, you're looking at. So, and I'm sure there are other factors that I, I just don't have top of mind right now, but, um, you know, at, at Frog, we're a, consult a consultancy. We do design, we do strategy, we do engineering. Um, but we solve problems. And so we need, and we often find ourselves utilizing um, T-shaped designers that are more very strong in a single discipline rather than a slice of UX. And that's because we find that most problems we have to solve encompass all layers under the sort of UX umbrella. Right, like I wouldn't just hand off part of my problem to an inner information architect and then take that from them to do the user experience design and then hand that over to an interaction designer to then hand it over to a researcher to test it. That is literally like me and my job at Frog um, is to do all of those things. So I think it depends. I, there are absolutely companies that say we want a researcher lead our research practice or be a part of our research practice. At Frog, everybody does research. And depending on how comfortable you are with research means you just, you may facilitate and lead research versus someone who might document or take notes. Um, and so I, I just think it depends on the company that you're looking at and you're researching to figure out what is it that you're really interested in? Because if you love information architecture, I mean, that could also be a content strategist role that doesn't necessarily fall under user experience design, depending on who you ask but has a lot of the same methodologies and a lot of the same ways that you think about content and organization and structure. Um, so it, you know, definitely I would say find that passion area within UX that you just want to geek out about and talk about because that's going to help continue to drive your future forward period. And that is passion. If you are like kind of, eh, I think this is okay. Like pretty soon you'll probably be looking for another job or another discipline. Um, unless you're just fine just working because working is a job. But like, I literally get out of bed in the morning to like mentor my designers, help solve problems and like just figure out weird solutions to like really gnarly problems. Um, and that requires all the tools in the UX toolkit. I agree with everything that Marty and Alexis are saying. Um, it's, it's definitely, well, it's highly important to have a general idea about, you know, the entire process, right? Including the research, the discovery, the uh, presentation, storytelling, getting buy-in, et cetera. That, that whole process, um, being that T-shaped designer is, is critical. And the reason is because based on the company that you work at, as Alexis was saying, uh, like at Home Depot, huge company, right? Hundreds of, I mean, tens of thousands of, you know, employees and all of that. Um, but you're actually not doing the research. So you're working with a research department, but you have to understand what data you're looking for, what type of research you would like to conduct, you know, the, the purpose of your research. I mean, you have to birth the idea, the research project, and then you collaborate with the uh, research department, right? So if you're, if you're someone who's just specialized in the UI and you don't want to, you know, gain any knowledge outside of that, th then a, a position like that will not necessarily work for you, right? And you're going to be doing yourself more harm than good. But having a good idea of the entire process, working through the research phase, conducting all of that on your own, analyzing the data, being able to take that through the design phases um, is, is important because it not only in, uh, increases your employee value, but it gives you the ability to sell yourself, you know, during job searches because not everyone can do that, 
right? So if you have a great idea of um, all the different aspects of interaction design and experience design, then uh, it sets you apart from the competition, right? And uh, it's critical to your performance on the job. You need to understand how all these different pieces come together. So you can still specialize in one, you know, I, I call myself a UX designer, but I've done hundreds of hours of research for, you know, a startup before. I've done all the design work. I've done all the uh, analysis and the synthesis and, you know, presentation to stakeholders, multi-billion dollar companies. I've, you know, I've done everything. But um, if I didn't have that experience, then I would, you know, I would have been found uh, wanting during those times. And they're going to get somebody else to do the job for you if you, if you can't do it. So. I did want to clarify and to say when I said I don't not doing research, my designers are absolutely required to write the research plans. We have to talk with the research team. We have to tell them what we're trying to find out. They keep us from bringing cognitive bias or, you know, we've looked at it for too long. We, that they'll think to ask things we didn't think of. We'll work with them and then they'll run the test. So that was what I meant by I don't like doing it. I don't like doing it. It's not that you're not plan it or understand aware of it. it's just the physical thing of doing it so you know, i didn't yeah. there's any misunderstanding yeah. i didn't want to no i think we're i think you know like guys you have to so you, you can the beauty of this of, of our discipline though is you can decide where which aspects you want to focus on right you want to dig deeper on and be that t you know that tall part right so if you know like marty's saying like she doesn't like research well she gets to make to call those shots and say you know i'm not going to do it i'll find someone to do it or you know and and that's that's the the choice that we get to make right but if if you don't specialize in anything well that's a problem too but but you know but marty's saying okay well she's got her specialty and the research part she does understand it she can do it if need be but she would rather, you know, rather delegate it because of that um, experience that she's, you know, she has and that level that she is. But uh, uh, it, it takes, you know, it's a gradual step. You, you'll be able to get to that point where you can make those choices, but you have to start somewhere. And that first step is getting a good understanding of the 360 of how everything works together. Yeah. yeah and I'll add, like, I, I don't want, especially for like the brand new, like, UX designers who are like, what is this? What's going on? Do I like this? Um, I definitely don't want to like bombard you all with the semantics of T-shaped designers and like what is appropriate. I think what's really awesome about this discipline is that you get to be a problem solver in whatever way works best for you and the company that you choose to work for. So, you know, whether it's doing a word cloud or getting your first job or whatever to uncover those aspects of the umbrella that you love, whether it's research or micro interaction design or um, strategy or future casting or UX or UI, finding those things and then starting to figure out what that means for you as a designer in communicating that to companies that way you can locate those companies that that mesh well with you whether you're a generalist or a specialist or a t-shape or i know someone's talking about an m shape on the chat um there are companies out there that will accommodate all of you in all of the awesomeness that you decide to become uh, and will grow into so it's just about finding ways and always paying attention to yourself um, and the experiences that, that you have to continue to identify what you're interested in and what you should con continue to focus on or grow skills in. Yeah, and adding, adding on to the end of that, there was a, um, was, I think it was the first time a number of years ago that I'd actually heard the term self-efficacy as opposed to self-confidence, which also comes, can be translated into arrogance or whatever. But a self-efficacy is a definition of that, that you know in your heart that if there was a complicated or difficult task, you could do it. And you look at it as something to be, you know, enjoyed and done as opposed to something that you're afraid of or trying to avoid. And that if you can do things, push yourself safely and learn that self-efficacy, which is the only way you can get it is by actually doing this, is do that little bit of time and build that self-efficacy over time. And that is an amazing thing to go forward because then you're, fearless to a degree and you're not afraid to say 
like it's, I'm standing in front of all of you going, I don't like doing research. Um, that the know thyself thing is a very big deal. So if you can work on things and build it over time, um, Alexis and William are completely right. You'll see the park that, where you fit, where your problem solving skills are and be confident in that. And there's nothing more better than when I'm interviewing, that's what I'm looking for. When you people come in and I can see that level of self-efficacy and say, do you know how to do this? And they go, nope, but if you give me a month, I can learn it. And you go, okay, that's, that's, that's what, that's what I want to see. I love that. Um, feel free to jump in, Amanda or Andrean, if you have questions. Sorry, I'm doing the exact opposite of what I said I was going to do, which was sit back and just listen, because um, <laughs> I can't help myself. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, I did want to go back, because uh, Marty, you mentioned the importance of understanding analytics and the business, which is definitely outside of UX in a lot of ways although not entirely. What other skills are the things that you guys are looking for um, when you're in those hiring positions? How, wh wh and you also mentioned, you know, the ability to grow and learn and the willingness to learn. What, what, what else are you looking for? Who wants to start us off on that one? <laughs> Alexis, you, you want, I'll, okay, I, I'm sorry, I was, gonna, I, was, I was so hoping she was going to take this one. Um, <laughs> I was like, um, I interview very strangely. Well, I've been told I interview strangely uh, compared to other, in that um, once you've made it through, you know, if you're, especially if you're in a there's a big corporation, you've made it through the HR gamut and, you know, the, the filters and the screens and the phone screening and the me reviewing your resume and, you know, I've only got time to interview so many people. So, you know, if, if you get to an interview with someone like me, be, be confident that you made it through a lot to get there to begin with. So be proud. The, uh, um, but a lot of times uh, at that point, I've already looked at your book. I've looked at your website. I've looked at, you know, I've, I've got a fairly good handle on that. At that point, what I'm really going to start questioning you on are things that are, I've got to figure out if you're UX buzzword compliant or if you really know it. So I'll start doing things like, well, what happens if you say, well, you know, we've got a, a, a project and it's got three weeks and so what well, we're going to do, no, you don't have time for research. So now what do you do? I'll start taking stuff out of the step to see how you're going to react or how you're going to answer when something goes sideways, because this is business. Everything goes sideways. It's not, it's never like it is in the textbook. There's always a research budget that's pulled. There's always a deadline you didn't see coming. There was always something, a, a requirement or the infamous um, lovingly referred to the, 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 the CEO poop and swoop where they didn't tell you some huge thing and this person that you had no idea swoops in at the last minute and blows up all your plans and, but the deadline didn't move. So how are you gonna react when that happens and in the interviews, those are the kind of questions I'm going to throw at you because I, I need to see you think on your feet. And that gets back to that self-efficacy thing. If you're confident and you know, and I, and I get stuff like, absolutely, ma'am, I have no idea, but you know what? I go research it and I'd be back to you with a plan by tomorrow morning. I'd be like, that's, that's, that's what you want to hear. So yes, yeah, just be prepared in the business world that everything can go sideways and that these nice little it's always good to see the process plans and you do this and you do research and we iterate and we see the little diagrams and yeah, it doesn't really, it doesn't really always work out like that. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is think, can you, I want, I want confident people who can look me in the eyes and say, yes, ma'am. And I, I don't know it right now, but I'll, but I'll know it by tomorrow. Guys, like, understand what why you're doing what you're doing throughout your design process i think as marty said like you know we see a lot of oh you know the sticky notes the affinity maps and this and that it's like it's all great but don't just show oh well, i did this or i created a persona so it must be correct or i nailed it no it doesn't work like that right so truly understanding every step of the process why you do what you do right um, and then knowing that deeply, just like off the top of your head, you understand it. And then you also understand the limitations and the obstacles that come with the real 
world, right? You know, in business, like there are so many obstacles that you're going to face. So what do you do, you know, if you, you're not able to go through your beautiful process that you have outlined, um, being able to think on your feet and just really, because if you truly understand it, then you, you will come up with ways that solve the problem, but, um, but does not necessarily go through that step by step that you initially created. Right. But you can still convey that message to the hiring manager and say, hey, look, well, you know what? I do understand how this could play out in this scenario. But um, if I'm not able to you know, conduct research, I might just pull out from my experience or, you know, do some A-B testing or this or that. Just being able to just kind of still problem solve if uh, your process is interrupted. Right. And that is very, very important. I feel like a lot of the boot camp, um, you know, students and, and you know, mentees that I mentor just like they love the process it's all pristine and it's like hey look I did this it's like great but you know do you really get it how did you you know land on a user persona well I asked three or four people you know on the street okay great but that's not really how you, you know it's like do you understand the whole process behind it and then you can come up with your own way that's the thing feel free to you know create your own methods of uh, achieving that same result right, in a way that generates the best outcomes uh, to solve the problem you're looking to solve. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to yes and Marty and William. Um, so you're probably not going to hear something drastically new from me, but I think what I always look for is the work, first and foremost. Um, I want to see a portfolio that within three to five minutes, I understand who you are. And honestly, that's literally all the time you're getting from me. Like when I see eight, 80 applicants come through like the frog mailbox, everyone gets like three minutes or less most likely. So you need to curate your portfolio to, to try and get me steered towards what it is you want me to look at first on my first click. And then when I see that, I need to see who you are as a designer, as a person, as a problem solver, as a tinkerer, as a thinker because everybody has the same design process. It is literally just the design process. When we go from research to outcomes, to design, to validation, to final comp, to clickable prototype, like literally every single portfolio is going to have that because that is legitimately the design process. But what, what I need to know is that not only do you have those foundational skills, but why how are you presenting that you recognize why you're using those skills, when you're using those skills, and what those skills are articulating for you? So why did you do research? And why did you choose generative contextual research versus like waiting until you did validation at the end of the project? Like those decisions help me understand that you understand the actual fundamentals behind research, when you should use it, and why you choose one over the other. And then if you say, I created a persona and I created design principles, I don't want to just see that moment in time of like, look, I checked a box, I created a persona and design principles. If you then have designs that I'm going to look at, show me how they map back to those design principles that were so important for you to communicate. But if you're not connecting those dots, then all I see is the potential, my teacher told me to do it in this process, so I did it in this process. And here's a representation of my outcome. And that does not mean that you understand what it is that you're learning. It just means that you did the thing. And so because, especially at a consultancy at Frog, we don't work on our own products. We don't have our own service. Our product is our people. So we work with whatever our clients ask us to work in. That could be oil and gas. It could be autonomous shipping. It could be financial services. It could be automotive. It could be whatever. So you have to be able to communicate that you're a problem solver and you're just going to like figure it out. Like you have a process to uncover and ask questions and pivot and create solutions and sketch and wireframe and come up with options that could be wrong, but could be right. And then demonstrate that you have a rationale to help you understand and communicate which is the right solution or which one you thought was right in that moment. And that lets me see who you are as a person and what you're thinking about, like what questions you're asking. Because again, I'm not going to hire you because you made a, an e-commerce website once because we may never make an e-commerce website, 
but I might hire you because you could talk about these 50 different ways that you tried to create a product card and why they're all valuable and what you landed on. Because then that says you iterate and you think through what the right solution is and you question existing paradigms and you push the mark on what could be and you think about what the future could be or, or what the right solution is. So it's about connecting these dots. It's about everything Marty and William said. Um, and I think it's really always trying to find that way to focus on who you are as a designer and, and how you're coming up with your solutions and ideas and then articulating that passion behind why you want to do this and, and why you want to move forward. And you guys if are you all... Have, oh, go ahead. William. I was going to say, if you have ways to, or if uh, one thing I would, I would say or recommend is get your critical thinking hat or juices flow it, you know, for lack of a better way to put it. But, but um, your critical thinking ability is like, it's gold, right, in this industry, because tools change, industries change. I mean, I was in home, home improvement, right, which is Home Depot. Now I'm in fintech, right? And this is an entire, these are, you know, entirely different industries. Uh, and prior to that, I was in automotive and then education. So it's not necessarily your, you know, um, like, yeah, you can be industry specific, but your critical thinking uh, ability and your problem solving skills, that's what's going to propel you as you go through your, uh, your career, right? So um, figure out ways that you can think in your feet. And, you know, there are tons of resources and exercises, uh, design exercises are uh, out there online that allows you to practice, 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 and just, you know, keep solving problems to get, you know, get familiar with that process. Because during interviews, you will be asked a ton of trick questions or just, you know, um, just irregular questions that test your critical thinking ability, as Marty and Alexis are saying. So uh, you just have to be ready. You have to know your stuff because this is the only way you can prove and say, you know what? Uh, I mean, I just had you know, hours of interview for, for this new role. Uh, well, not recently, but throughout the process, right? The hiring process. And it's just, you know, it's not your typical, you know, okay, well, you have a portfolio, this and that, but the questions are going to be very direct and very um, on the spot thinking on your feet. So, Will, um, what if you had this scenario? How are you going to solve it? And then I had to just go, all right, well, I could do this and that. And then they'll rebuttal it and say, well, what if you could not, you know, as Marty said, you can't perform research. Well, I'll do this instead. I'll do that. You always have to be just boom, boom, boom. You know, it's like ping pong. If they go left, you go right. Just keep going, you know. So figure out ways you can practice that uh, more so you're used to it because that critical thinking uh, is, is gold uh, for, for your career. Somebody on the chat asked me for an example of someone of an interview that had gone really well. I'll give you a story. Um, was a, I was interviewing for a designer that what she, she may be here. Okay, if you're here, you can jump in because <laughs> a couple because I did invite them, um, and it was for somebody who's specializing in who do a lot about search and discovery and tagging. It's a very complicated thing, obviously finding music in in, in uh, where I work, and uh, so she came in for the interview and she was very quiet and she was kind of you know she was very not like me at all. And uh, um, I started talking, I started asking the questions going through the, you know, tell me about the story of when this happened, you know, the normal interview questions. And when she got off, was telling about explaining in her portfolio, it was like, I couldn't get her to shut up. She tell, was, she every, and I did this and we did this and we did this and then I tried this, but this didn't work. And, and, and it was, it was like, she was like one of those little zip toys that somebody went and, and off she went explaining everything. And then what I learned was we got into a conversation because I was actually engaged in the story and I wanted to find out what happened. So when you, when you're in an interview and you start realizing that the person on the other side of the table, that we're now in a conversation going back and forth, you're, you're, I guarantee you, you're acing the interview because it's no longer just here's my standard form of questions. I, you now have me engaged and I'm listening and engaged with what you're showing. So that's a very big, the, but the, 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 she could explain every pixel. She could trace it back to every, and the, we went back here. She was doing what Alexis, she would go back and show something. And with this persona, and, and at that point, I, I asked a question and she just went and I thought, yep. And I knew five minutes in, but yet that's, that's the one. 
sometimes you just know. Alexis or William, did you ever have a candidate where you can show as an example of like, whoa, <laughs> I know that you know this stuff. Well, I'd so say, uh, um, oh, sorry, I, there's a lag. Uh, am I still laughing? Am I on? You're back. Oh, I'm back? <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was just going to say the, oh, there was a thought. Um, Darn, it's gone. Okay, Alexis, you can j jump in. I'll jump back in in a second. Okay, yeah, interrupt yeah. me if you need to, William. If it comes back, just and, and this happens to us too. I know, so. I was just like, <laughs> wait, what? It was so good, but anyway, it's all good. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's every, every absolutely you nailed it interview is exactly what Marty described. Like, you know your work. You don't have to think about it. You're not second guessing. You're not like, remembering something because the case study you decided to present in front of me is like three years old and you haven't reviewed it or gone through it. Time doesn't matter. That's okay. If it's an old case study, it's an old case study, but you have to know your work and you've got to love it. You got to, you got to show me that you lived it. Um, and if you can do that and if you can just geek out on like the sketches and the wireframes and I did this motion study cause I didn't know it was going to happen. So I tested to see if it would work and like, I moved paper around and we found out that it didn't work. So then I did this, like, then I'm just like, heck yeah, this person is awesome. Like, not only do they love their job so much that like you are lit up while you're describing this work, but you can literally also describe rationale, process, narrative, decisions, all of these things come out when you really know your case study, when you love what you do whether you know it or not. And it's, it's those people that automatically just like ace interviews. Cause you're just like, this person is a geek like me and I love it. And let's do this thing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not to say that like, if, if you don't have that experience and you can't put that experience forward authentically that like you won't do well in interviews, like that's okay. But those are the people that I seem to like, just remember like, yeah, they were, they were a no brainer, but there are many people that I've interviewed that, we had to have discussions around and like, will it work? And do we think their work is good enough? Or do we think they're in the right role or should they be more senior or less senior? Um, so there's, I think, plenty of room for you to grow and experiment in the interview process. Um, but I think the no brainers are the, the people who really just exude problem solving and why and how. I agree, I agree. Okay, so I remember it exactly. So. I think a good way to actually put this in practice is if you have time on your portfolio, um, some of your past work that you've already done, as you know, like Alexis was saying, like even some of our works are three years old and you know, old, right? Two years old. If you're able to go back and do them differently based on your current knowledge or experience, you know, that definitely helps spark these kind of conversations during interviews because then the hiring manager could see that, well, maybe not even see that, but ask you, well, why did you do X, Y, Z? And then you could come back in and say, well, you know, I did this at the time, but actually I would have done it differently today, right? If I had to do it my way and this is why. So that is a good way to kind of get the conversation going during interviews of saying, well, this is what I did, you know, for this company, because one, you have stakeholders to report to, you had, you know, uh, product managers and, you know, you had a lot of different, um, people, right, different opinions around this particular feature. But if you had your way, this is what you would have done. So being able to show that definitely, I think, is a good way to spark that conversation when, you know, during interviews, if you have the time, definitely on your portfolio. But I know it's all time. So just a little tip. That's what I was going to say. Um, but it always just um, any interviews that I haven't recently hired any uh, UX uh, designers, but I'm helping hire for Home Depot. Well, you know, uh, the, my role at Home Depot to fill that. Um, but what we look for is someone that knows. You got to understand your stuff because terminologies, like everything else is just very official and it's great. It, you know, it, it's great to know that, to understand the language, to speak the lingo and all that. But if you know it in your heart, if you practice this stuff, you breathe UX, you sleep UX, you, you know, you understand it, then it's easier for you to have that you know, back and forth with a hiring manager and geek out about what you love, right? So that passion is going to be a huge driver. 
um, and just understanding why you're doing this because we are problem solvers and we're creating a better world by building incredible experiences. This is huge. It's, it's, it's the best thing ever. It's the best job in the world. So once you that and appreciate that and then nurture that, that uh, passion will drive your, uh, it will fuel your drive throughout you know, your career. So one, one thing I wanted to add is I'm a super extrovert. I'm just going to put that out there, right? Like, and I know that you, you all, I'm like exude energy. Oh my God, you guys like, Bleh. but it's, I know that there are introverts out there and that is okay. Like you do not have to change who you are fundamentally either to be successful in a job interview. So no, the designer that you absolutely right. The designer that remember when she came and she was so introverted and so quiet. I thought, Oh, she, she'll just get run over on my team. And then she started to talk. Yeah. And then, it was just, she lit up and I thought, okay, she'll be fine. But she yeah. was definitely an introvert. And Timber, if you're here, wave or something. Absolutely. I mean, and so same, like I, other great interviews have just been, I have met people who have been so nervous to even be in this room or to be even be on a phone call to where it was like struggling to get words out. Right. And it's just like, it's okay. Like breathe. We're all here together. We've got an hour. Like Go, let's talk about it. And so oftentimes the interviewers will try to get you and engage you in a dialogue to try and like break you out of shell, like bring some, calm some nerves. Um, but it, it is still a process that you still need to be able to communicate. Even if you are an introvert, you do need to know that this discipline requires communication. It requires uh, rationale. It requires being able to articulate why you're making these decisions and why you thought they were successful or why you could back up when they were unsuccessful, how you pivoted. Now that's true in the interview process, but that's also true in your day-to-day -day work environment. And some work environments will allow you and give you the flexibility to like, I need to think on that and I'll get back to you this afternoon. Obviously it's harder to do that in the interview process. So as much as you can Practice, practice sitting, practice standing, do it in the shower, look in a mirror, talk to your partner, talk to your mom, like whomever, like just practicing gets you more familiar with what it is that you're going to say, even if people aren't firing off like questions at you. So you can just become a little bit more comfortable around your process and your work if having conversations one to one or one to five seems really daunting uh, and really scary. And I'm an introvert. I'm not. <laughs> wow, this is <laughs> talk. Uh, who knew that, that ENTJ thing plugged? Don't you dare. Um, I, there were a bunch of questions that came up on, on the, the chat about um, transition. I, I, there's one question I want to save for the 12 months, what I think is going to happen over the next 12 months, response to COVID and Black Lives. We could push that one to the end because we're, it's, the, but there are a bunch of questions that came up about the um, moving from individual, um, contributor to leadership roles and stuff because uh, uh, those of us who have done that um, my take on it is uh, and I've had a lot of discussions about this was um, you have to seriously ask yourself if the director role is what you want and, and because it's very different I have um, my right hand who's doing up the principal path that she loves solving the problems. She looks at my stuff with budgeting and HR and, and all that stuff and goes, oh my God, I would die. Like, how can you even stand and put up with stuff like, but that's part, but that's still, you're running a department. There is, there is a point when you become, especially if you're working at, at a, you know, an internal department like I am, where you are actually a director and you run a department and you must do all the things that all the other directors do in addition to just doing UX. Um, there are uh, there are obviously principal path senior principals very high in where you're you stay focused on your craft and you're moving forward. So one of the things is to really take a look at as your career grows um, is um, the myth is I want to be a creative director or I want to be a UX director because somehow that gives you control over what the end result is going to be. That's a lie. There's no control. <laughs> no, there's always somebody who's going to tell you that whatever you did has to be changed. That's never, it's not like you hit this level and then you make the final decision and this is what it's going to look like. That, that's never, 
I'm, I'm, I trust me, I'm an old person. It has never happened once in my entire career that I got the final say over what something was going to, what would the absolute final say on what something was going to be. So um, to be, be sure when you, when you do this, look at other, look at all the career paths that are available to you and don't just think you have to go up this one because there's a lot of options. And, and, and it also makes a big difference if you're a UX director with my role versus where Alex is, Alexis is or where William, I'm not sure what your new company does, William, but there's, there's differences in the roles there depending on whether you're an internal or whether you're a consultancy. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Marty, you mentioned something earlier about uh, buzzword compliant. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? The, 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 buzz, the buzzword compliance statement. Yes. It goes back to when Alexis and I were talking about everybody's got the process. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you do this and you walked it through and you've done the stuff and there and everybody and, and, you, and there is a fashion industry as element associated with part of this. And after a while, you can start to see when, you know, like for the buzzwords, like nobody empowers anybody anymore, but now we're doing, now we're leaning in, you know, that's the fashion uh, corporate buzzword at the moment. And you can kind of tell when someone really knows their stuff versus when they've read a bunch of medium articles and are coming in and are now regurgitating <laughs> what they think I want to hear. And that's what I meant by buzzword, fully buzzword compliant. Is there, uh, I've heard a lot about um, uh, filtering during the screening process. Are there any um, uh, buzzwords or keywords that you find that you have to have from a candidate once they apply for a UX position? I don't know. I said, I get yeah, the, the others. Um, I, I, I don't know of any large corporate HR firm that is, is not going through a text reader at this point, looking for, looking for words to screen the resumes. Um, generally, I would recommend you have three, you have one because yeah, there's three personas that are going to be interviewing you. There's the, there's the, um, there's, you've got to have the one that's got to get past the, the, the automated, uh, past the bots. And that may not be the one that you put on your website because the first thing I'm going to do is after I'm scan the resume, but I'm going to go to your, I'm going to go to your site and look at your stuff. I, I, I want to see, I want to see the work. But there's um, but I, I don't know. I, unfortunately, I don't know of any large HR firm that isn't using, isn't using some kind of automated system to screen resumes. Mm -hmm. As unfair as that may be. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's just it, it's about being honest and authentic, right? So if you're throwing buzzwords all over the place just to like pick up on a bot or like say that you have experience, I'm gonna see that in your in your work. So. There are plenty of industry standard terms that every single one of you could fire off like nine right now, I'm sure, and all of those are accurate and all of those are correct. What I would say is when I look at a portfolio, you should have at least three relevant works to the discipline that you're applying for. If you have less than that, I'm sorry, we're probably not going to take a look at you because we just have so many applicants. If you can't communicate in three projects, work, then it's just not enough breadth for us. In terms of resume, I think it's always good to list softwares that you're familiar with, particularly design software. So are you only an Adobe Creative Cloud person? Cool. Can you do Sketch? Can you do Figma? Are you prototyping in something like, um, uh, I've got to look at my <laughs> like framer, I'm looking at my desktop. <laughs> Um, but it's those things that also let me see how well-rounded you are and how you might be able to fit in. Like some companies are still using Axure. Like I wouldn't set foot in that software again if I, if I didn't have to. Um, but at Frog, we're using Adobe Creative Cloud. We're using Figma. We're using cloud-based software that allows us to be collaborative. So become familiar with those tools and celebrate those tools in your, your resume. But if you're saying you're a researcher, but you don't really do research, then you're starting to put buzzwords in there on maybe one track of work that you did for two weeks in a class project, which doesn't really play as authentic, right? Like if I'm going to hire you as a researcher and you can't actually show me and demonstrate all of the ways in which you do that, we're going to see that pretty quickly. Um. I'm going to jump in. I'm, hi, everyone, by the way. I have been lurking. I'm assisting Andrena right now, um, now that Cindy's left. 
So I'll, I'm looking at the chat, I'm looking at everyone's questions. Um, if there's a lot of questions, some, I, I know that uh, Marty's looking at them as well. Uh, if we don't answer your question, it's not because we ignored you, it's just because there's so many. And sometimes they've kind of been answered by the guests. We did have one here that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, so, uh, Khan of Wong was asking about, um, and I hope I said your name right, by the way. Sorry if I did, if I butchered it. Um, have you had to deal with ageism? You know, we're talking about uh, people entering UX from everywhere. And um, they ask, this is a question obviously related to older people who switched to UX later from another career. So I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and address that. So I you think, know, yeah, go ahead, William. You know, interestingly, like I have, right? Um, and it's, it's hilarious to me because I'm one of those people that believes in my ability to um, solve problems, right? solve design problems like I love it I, I love this stuff I mean my wife is just tired of hearing me talk about UX every day so um but there's been there's been companies in the past I would say maybe five years ago so I have a total of about nine years of experience now so about halfway right uh throughout my uh my, my total experience um I would I would apply for, for uh, you know like UX design roles and I would be too young for it right I'm you know so it, it that was interesting to me right and I know when you think of age, ages and we just think you know like oh they're elderly and we have you know or older this and that but I was too young and I'm thinking you know why does it matter because you know I'm if anything I got um a modern approach, right? Which is a form of ageism right there. But, you know, if anything, it's, it shouldn't be a detriment. And I, you know, I feel the same way about um, the flip side of the coin where if someone is maybe five or 10 years older than, you know, a regular or what they were looking for, you still get more experience, right? So it's just a weird, I, I honestly don't understand how uh, hiring managers justify that, just in my opinion, but um, it's, it's just, I look at those, uh, those experiences and I say, you know what, it's your loss. And then I take that and I move on, right, onwards and upwards. Because at the end of the day, people are going to make their decisions and you just got to, you know, just got to do you and, and move forward. So. Yeah, I think what, what I'll add is there is always going to be unconscious bias in an interview process. And I know many companies are working toward ways to mitigate that and to push beyond that, whether it's obscuring your name or um, even like your past experience or, or how long you've been in the field or, or when you went to school or anything else like that. Granted, if you make it past the phase gates to a face-to-face -face conversation, obviously like it will be shown. What I think is important to recognize and what I've seen that has been potentially a detriment to some of the, um, the folks who have been around a little bit longer is it's important to recognize that while you might have X decades of experience in something, it doesn't mean that is relevant or one-to-one -one relational to UX. So if you're transitioning from psychology, for instance, I'm not hiring a psychologist, I'm hiring a user experience designer. So if you only have a, a boot camp, then you have 10 weeks of experience and I'm gonna hire you at an intern level with 10 weeks of experience at that price point and, and not at 20 years of experience of psychology plus 10 weeks of UX. So obviously that is a blanket sort of um, answer, which is a bit generic, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that in some instances, yes, your past experience can bolster your capabilities and will bolster your capabilities, but you need to make sure that you are always paying attention to the boots on the ground experience you have within the discipline that you're being hired for and be very real with yourself on, on what your expectations are of what level of job you're trying to get with the amount of, of, of experience <coughs> or that discipline. Um, and, and interesting note when, when, she, when you wrote that, that I laughed, it was, it was an interview who was a, a few years ago and I, um, I really did go into the interview and, and the woman who was interviewing me was much younger than me. And 
it went so badly that by I was seriously getting close to the end of the interview and I was almost ready to say, excuse me, if you'll call someone now, they can bring my walker and I might be able to make it to the car. There were questions like, did I think I would be able to keep up? Did I, because technology was changing so fast. You know, at this point in your career, you should be really focusing on things that would make you comfortable and things you really enjoy doing. I mean, it was really bad. And uh, um, I, I learned right then that I didn't want to work there um, because of that was, it, that was, I viewed that as a symptom of something else culturally because all corporations have cultures. They all do. And just so you'll know, you can't change them. They're like molasses. I mean, you, you need to, one of the things you're doing on an interview, is not that just you're talking to us, you're, you're, look, you're interviewing us too. You need to look at the, 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 the decor, the people, are they happy? You know, you're, you're scoping this out too. To, are you a fit to, for in this culture? Because you'd be much happier if you are. If you go in and you start faking it and saying stuff, you know, it's you're you're not gonna be happy. It's just it's not it's not gonna work. But that was when I knew I didn't want. So, in answer to the question, yes, the the um, it's unfortunate that um, as Alexa says, there's gonna be bias. It's it's just gonna be there when you see it. If then that's probably not the place. And there's so many wonderful companies that don't do it. Then by all means, go there. They deserve you. The good ones do. Great answers. Thank you so much for those. Um, I had a question that I actually meant to ask way earlier in, in the meeting, but um, you're all very successful and senior product designers at this point in your life. And you made reference on how things were different when you guys started this career. Uh, the question I had for you is, if someone wanted to start UX today, would you recommend that they have the same or follow the same path that you did? Um, or, or if you could go back uh, will you do something different? So I can, okay, I'm not seeing Marty or William un unmute, so I'll jump in here. <laughs> um, so oh, okay. I, oh, William, you want to go? My connection is unstable, so you go for it. Okay, I'll, all I'll right. Um, let's see. So no and, and no. Um, I, what do I want to say? Um, so I started in front end web development because I, I had to, but also like I was a big gamer and back then there were online clans that were just coming around because you could literally game against people for the first time across the globe. So I, I taught myself how to do web design. I taught myself how to do user experience design. I am self-taught and experienced on the job. Like there was no formal education in this stuff when I first started. Like y'all have a plethora of resources, which is amazing. Um, so take advantage of them. What I, I would say is, you know, because of my sort of disparate path and where I came and the different skill sets I had to learn based on where technology or where framing of titles were and job expectations and roles were, I learned just a really broad set of skills, which have been invaluable to me over my career. Now, I wouldn't recommend you like start as a front end web developer and then then transition into UX. Like I think you can shortcut those skills um, and learn and read books or take prototyping classes or anything else to like gain some empathy and some understanding from what those different disciplines do. I would say why I wouldn't go back in time and change the work that I've done or, or anything that I've done in the past is I spent 10 years in the beginning of my career in-house client side at like big box companies like Visa and PayPal working on like a single product. At times it felt very tedious um, and frustrating because I was redesigning form fields and making very incremental change to a well-established product that I couldn't just wave a magic wand at and literally change everything. It was all waterfall. So every process took four years or longer to get out the door rather than like people are responding and being able to put stuff in the market every six months or, or faster now. But that tedium forced me to create 200 page annotation specs that had me articulate every screen, every wire, every annotation, every instance, every click state 
So I can literally look at anybody's design system now and critique it without context because I can understand systems because of a decade of having to force myself to understand systems. So I could articulate that to a developer I was going to speak to once and then had to take all of my work and then make it happen over the next five years. So I, I would say take advantage of what you have today. There are, are ways to self-teach yourself. There are online classes. There are more formalized boot camps or classes or degree programs or anything else um, to, to build those skill sets, to, to connect with people um, and, and to push forward. Hi, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Hi, uh, do you have any advice for you know, former industrial designer that's in grad school hoping trying to switch career to US, UX design? The thing is, when I'm applying for positions, and most people don't know what industrial design, they didn't realize that um, there are a lot of skills that are transferable. So I really, I'm especially interested in Alexa since you work at Frog. And I actually want to know how much industrial design does Frog actually do? And, and more importantly, uh, do you have any advice for industrial designers you know, on how we leverage our background to, you know, to, transition, to make the transition? Sure. Um, so Frog absolutely does industrial design. Um, Austin, our Austin studio is more focused on digital and service design than product and industrial design. You, mostly in New York, Shanghai, EMEA is where we're doing actual physical builds of things. Um, granted, it all depends on client needs and asks. Um, you, when I see industrial designers apply for user experience roles at Frog, the skills that y'all have are incredible. And the most of the time, most of the time when I see the disconnect, it's because you're not, individuals are not translating those skills into anything digital that is applicable to, to the work that we're doing. So if you're looking for an industrial design role, which is creating physical things, then apply as an industrial designer. But if you want to get into web, apps, digital, software, enterprise, you need to create products and pieces in your portfolio that exemplify digital experience um, and use those same skills that you use in industrial design, like eons of sketching and different ways to communicate a problem is exactly the same problem solving that we do in a digital and online space. It's just a different application of that skill set. So that's where I typically see the disconnect in industrial designers wanting to become like UX or, or interaction designers at Frog is not being able to push past the, the physical product and into digital. It's interesting because I have the, the different, because I come from the car world where there are all kinds of, um, one of the things that I've noticed, then this kind of gets into the future of where everything is headed, is that the we're seeing more and more interfaces that are truly multimodal. And I don't mean just, I can't say her name because she'll talk from the other room, but that A word thing, you know, that, you know who she is. Anyway, um, there's a, um, there was, a, I did a, an article that, that said, you know, that we type at 40 words a minute, we speak at 130 and we read at 250. So the most actually efficient interface may be I speak and then I read the response that you talk and ask it and then it shows you a different input out. That's translating now into cars, refrigerators, your Nest thermostats, all these things that are doing UX that are very closely related to industrial design. You may want to start looking in those areas of companies that do that type of work because that may be a beautiful crossover for you to have a really, really successful Future for you personally, if you're coming from industrial design and you're going into those types of particularly multimodal interface design that's being built into products. And there's a lot of it, like her Tesla's coming to Austin. May rumor, rumor. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think that but there there's a lot there's a lot of work being done in that area that may be a terrific fit for an industrial designer who's crossing into user true true. Um, user experience, just my opinion. Okay, thank you. Toyota's in Dallas. <laughs> They're hiring. <laughs> okay. I'd just like to quickly jump back in. I, that was a great question. And um, if anyone wants to ask the question themselves, just let us know in the chat and we'll call on you. 
Um, but just coming back to the ages, and we've got a, a question, uh, I won't say who from, I think it's a, a, a private question, but um, is it okay if you're like older and say you've been doing it for several decades in UX, um, but you, you just don't want to be a director or a senior level position? Is there a problem uh, with appearing over-experienced? I'm kind of paraphrasing the question, but I believe that's what they were asking. Um, asking for a friend, Kareem? <laughs> you could say that, yeah. No, it's, it's not me, I wish it was me. Um, <laughs> but I had that much experience to throw around. I, I would call myself much more mid, but, but, uh, but yeah, would you, have you seen that happen? Is that an issue? If you don't want to go direct to the track, if you just want to be like, actually grappling with problems, but you've well, been the a, 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 a brilliant man, actually, who's our, um, he's a PhD and from Johns Hopkins in biomedical, he works for us. He's, he's, uh, he is a, uh, a, one of the world's leading experts in voice interfaces. And um, he's 69 and he's a VP and he has no direct reports, nor does he want any. Um, Tom likes building, Tom likes solving problems. And he's worked his way through and he, he had gone through the manager track and said, no, this isn't for me. And um, was able to show the true value. I would not have any problem hiring somebody who came to me and said, look, I was a director for however many years. I just want to go solve problems now. I'd like to be a senior designer on your team. Um, I'm, I would not have a problem with it. I can't speak for other people, but don't be afraid to say that. And, but in the interview, make sure that you, you know, that I have now, I, you know, my 401ks, my house is paid for, whatever it is, that you're probably not allowed to ask in an interview. But if, there, but, but if, you, if that's where you are in your career, be honest with the person who's hiring you because, or who's interviewing you, because that will be a big help. And then, and then you'll know. But that's, uh, um, uh, but yes, there's absolutely, I believe there's a lot of path for career people doing designer, for designers who are getting older and just don't want to deal with the management stuff but still are fully capable and interested of staying engaged and learning every new thing that comes along down the pike and, uh, and staying on, staying current. I think like, uh, just add to that, you know, team fit, culture fit, just being authentic during these, uh, hiring interviews and, um, uh, you know, just being honest about what you're looking for because the hiring manager will probably ask you, you know, what's next for you. I, I get that. I, I get asked that a lot, right? And um, you have to know what you want to do next. Do you want to be a part of a team? Do you want to, you know, lead a team? Do, you know, you have to have a direction just with everything else or like everything else. You have to set a goal. You have to um, know where you're going, right? Otherwise, any road will take you nowhere. So um, knowing what you want to do helps you really present yourself in an authentic manner during interviews. You could just say, look, I just want to be hands-on, you know, in the weeds, actually put it in work. That's what I want to do. Uh, and that, that comes up very well because then the hiring manager knows exactly where to place you and see, if, you know, just they can gauge if you'd be a good fit for what they're looking for. And that's just how, you know, how it would, it would go. Yeah, I think it requires you also doing the research on the companies that you are applying for, right? So if, if you've got 40 years of experience in user experience design and you're going to an, an ad agency and you're like, hey, I just want to be a senior designer, they're going to say, that's awesome, but like, I want to leverage you as a director. Like, I can find senior designers, but like, I need your skills to do X, Y, Z. And if they don't have any paths forward, like principal or, or anything else that like continues a craft track forward beyond management, then that might not be the company for you. Um, so you are interviewing companies just as much as they're interviewing you and you can't, it is not always possible for you to potentially like force or persuade companies to take your position on what you want to do as an individual in the role based on the reporting structure that they have and the goals and needs of that company. Um, so, so I think it's, a, it's, it's about you doing your due diligence too and seeing if, if it's an applicable path for you there without having to just try and force it. Thank you. I wanted to jump in and um, kind of focus a little bit more on what tonight's uh, meetup is about and uh, ask this question. Um, how do you guys see UX evolving in the future, uh, especially under um, the current um, climate? 
um, that we are right now. I think I see UX being more, uh, I guess I see UX designers being more intentional about accessibility and inclusion um, in the future. You know, I feel like that's something that um, we might be uh, unconsciously biased to, myself included, right? But, uh, but because of all the conversation uh, going on around, you know, you have uh, racism and you have accessibility, you have um, just, a, you know, a bunch of different uh, hot topics right now surrounding design, right? What role is design playing in the society currently, I think? Um, over the next few years, what we're going to see is uh, just more intentional uh, uh, designers being more intentional with, you know, the experiences that we create to, uh, to be more inclusive and uh, accessible. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll plus one like the the inclusion and the the intentionality there. Um, you know, their their accessibility has been around for at, at least the 17 years I've been doing this. Um, and it, it is still like an upward push to to get companies on board with accessibility, right? Like it's not it's not just widely acceptable. Um, same with UX, right? Like that's how UX started. I had to always fight for the value of why there's a UX team and a designer in your company. And granted, we've kind of gotten past that hurdle, but we're doing that. I think there are movements and conversations around designing with and not for. Um, so as we look at, um, there's an organization called the Disabled List, for instance, and how can we stop designing for people with disabilities and actually include them in the process so that we're making collaborative decisions together and you're not just answering or solving my problem. So I think the intentionality and the inclusion of how we're going to be thinking about the solutions we're creating will double down a bit and will continue to perpetuate forward. In terms of technology, I know we talked a little bit about like artificial intelligence earlier. Um, AI has been around, machine learning has been around. It's just intelligence in design systems and intelligence in engineering systems. I don't think that there will be a day in which computers or robots like take our jobs. Um, I think that they will continue to enhance the products and the services that we create by infusing learned intelligence from users to make their experience better. As we look at emerging technologies, whether it's blended intelligence or like connected environments or artificial intelligence, um, extended realities, things like that, similar problems to solve, just a different space to solve them in, right? So whether we, we create physical buildings and spaces that connect with digital technology and interfaces as a seamless environment and not just as a layer on top of the other as they are today, or interfaces that allow us to fully immerse or have layers of abstraction and context on top of the, the world in which we perceive it today to make our jobs maybe easier or better, I think our tools on our toolkit and tools on our tool belt will continue to improve um, just like all of our software design has continued to improve and give us the answer to needs that we didn't know that we had like Figma or Adobe XD allowing us to like prototype in the software itself without having to like go to, to different tools. Um, so I, I just think that we will continue to grow in our skill set, and these technologies will help us become better and better suited to solve the problems of tomorrow. Um, I think uh, to again go back to that that key term of designing with instead of designing for. Um, uh, uh, I, I know that you know that this is my own you know my own personal mind, but but there's kind of really nothing more mental, my personal for designing is than being somebody inside your car. I mean, you're there. It's a very especially so, you know you and the radio. <laughs> And there's a lot of times there's other people in there with you, but even that is changing so fast. I mean, we're on the verge of autonomous cars where I've spent my, you know, the better part of the, my, my, uh, the time at Sirius XL learning about driver distraction, and that could all go away real fast. And then I'm going to have to completely reimagine the entire entertainment experience inside a car because now there's not going to be driving or there's only going to be driving sometimes. And how are you handling that transition? And again, I, we talked on this earlier with the industrial design pieces of as these things 
evolve and it's not just a screen. And I guess the thing I would tell you is to push yourself to stop thinking in terms of a 2D flat space. It's not, it's true user experience. And I, I, I feel kind of bad that user has kind of become almost a buzzword where people say it and they don't really know what it means because it is truly a user experience and you need to be with that person and work with them so they can help you design what they need. And if you can do that, you're going to end up with products that aren't just, you know, the world's full of products that people built and said, this is really great. And then it, you know, tanked because no one used it. And I think that, that working with figuring out how, in, especially in early concept phases, how do you get out with a real person and show them something and have them communicate back to you and build and iterate and have yourself up your and be bold and try something else and say, well, I thought this was a great idea, but it sucked and throw it out and do it again. That kind of, that kind of working with your users, true, true inclusion is going to be a huge win for every, for all of us. And I think we're getting much, much better at it as opposed to just, you know, we did, we went to usertesting.com and we got results and we made decisions based on that. Well, and you. You know, yeah, as we talk about, I think I saw a question about service design, but I think it's, it's a great point, Marty, because especially in this time, right? Like people are calling executive boards out on, on diversity, on inclusion, on equity, things like that. So when we think about that customer's experience, it's, it's everything and how they perceive the brand to how they use the product to how the product is connected to something else like Alexa. I can say it because we can't have one in my house because of my name. I know. Sorry, Marty. Um, but it's, it's all of those like discrete moments in how I think about your product or use it or experience it or change it from me to my wife to someone else in my household to calling customer service because I have a problem. And also my perception of you as a company, as someone who relates to me or my community or anything else is, is everything that we need to be thinking about and designing for as we move forward. And I think everything that we're experiencing through COVID to Black Lives Matter to everything else in the world, environmental change, um, is only going to reinforce the feelings and perceptions that we have about companies and corporations that are making the products and services that we use. Um, I, I have another, well, it's like, there's a whole bunch of questions. It's blowing up. I don't know if you've been looking at the chat. It's crazy. I can't keep up. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to just tie it back to the theme of tonight, which is obviously keeping your career future forward. And we had a bunch of questions asking about how might I transition from X to, you know, use a research role or use a you know, product design role. So I guess that's the first half. I'm kind of sandwiching two things together here. So feel free to, to pass them apart or just ask, answer one. Um, and the second one is, I guess, kind of what I've been interested to know is um, at other times where you've deliberately done something to make your career like future forward or, or future proof or, you know, to augment your skills that way within your career. So we're kind of asking for people transitioning and also when you're in the career. Any thoughts? You stumped them. Can we I, sorry, I get, I, I, I Did guess, I, sorry. I guess, yeah, no, I guess the, the, if for the people who are doing and looking at for transitioning from one field in, into UX, um, and this is my, my plug for, this is my plug for Adobe. Uh, and, I, and and we did. I my team we switched to XD about about a year and a half ago because I needed the sound. I needed the I, there are features in that particular product that I that I needed to, in order to be able to actively prototype. Is whatever tool you use, sit down and build it. You can't read about playing a piano. You have to do it. So even if it's if you're transitioning and you're looking for your first job, find a nonprofit, find anything that can you uh, redo your mom's quilting club webs, whatever, anything, to do get a real problem and sit down with a real prototyping tool and you know get on Lucid Chart, make a flow chart, figure out the problems, write, you know, learn about writing user stories, make yourself go through this process and build it. And then when you're finished with that, do it again. And then do another one and do another one. There's nothing, you, you cannot just read about this and do it. And every time you do one of these things, even if you go take, 
If you're brand new and you don't even want to do that, just go get an existing website and just rebuild it exactly the way it is. Can you rebuild that in your prototyping tool? Those small steps of achievements and, and, and will build that, again, that feeling of self-efficacy. And that will give you more and more and more confidence. And I, 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 but right now there's so many great nonprofits. There's so many people who would love your help is get the tools, sit down. Yeah, it's hard. Every, I can guarantee you all three of us at one point are two in the morning, three in the morning, we're playing, I'll do just this one more thing. And then you look up and you're like, oh my God, it's daylight. And I have to go because you stayed up all, because you were so in the zone that you get. And when you can, when you get that, it's really, that's the, that's the heart right here. That's what makes this job so great. But get the, get those, just start small practice. Just, and don't just read about it. Do it and find places to do it. Even if it's copying someone else's stuff. And th so that would be my suggestion for people who really want to get into it because if you're that excited about it, what we talked about that, that fire when you're in the interview that you love this and we can tell if you love this, we'll be able to tell, even if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, even if your book is, is, you know, is short, even if it's projects, we can still tell you're not going to come in as a senior designer. You're not going to come in as a principal, you know, you're not, but, but that's, but, but, but that kind of enthusiasm will get you in. And uh, as far as the, the, well, over this, that was getting it. Anyway, the, Alexis, you go, we'll do go. We'll come back to the other one. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, plus up on everything that Marty said uh, in terms of transitioning, um, you know, even a simple exercise like creating a word cloud, right, of like things that you're doing in your current job, like project manager or industrial designer or psychologist or whatever, and then create a word cloud for user experience designer and start making things like Marty said, start to find those connections of one to one, like, oh, yeah, this maps 100% with what this is doing. And then you can start to talk about that, not only in your resume, but also your portfolio, but also in the interview. So you can find ways to tie those relationships and those connection points back to the discipline that you want to be in, which is user experience design. Like if you're a project manager, you know so much about this discipline already, and you have so many client relationship skills, and you know so much about potentially metrics and what the business is looking for, it's then finding ways to connect that to physical work of something that you've made so that I can see that you have the foundational skills. So always connect those dots. In terms of augmenting your, your skills to continue to grow, what, what, I, what you have to do is continue learning. So all the time, like I get inspiration walking down the street when I can go outside. Um, I get, uh, you know, inspiration looking online. I get inspiration from the people that I work with. I get inspiration from conversations that I'm having about problems that I'm not solving, but someone else is solving. But if you are only ever dedicating your nine to five work hour to career development in what you're doing, which means my career is my nine to five job as I'm heads down doing work, then you are doing yourself a disservice. You need to spend mornings outside of work, afternoons outside of work, weekends outside of work, nighttime outside of work, getting inspired, understanding what technology is doing. And it doesn't mean that you've got to work like 90 hour weeks. It's not like you have to set a set like three hour block every night to learn something or to learn a new skill, but you need to keep growing your understanding of the world, you need to keep growing what technologies are out there, and you need to find a way to play around with tools and build skills that you might not have because maybe you're just wireframing every day and you're not prototyping. So find some time and make the time to learn prototyping school skills and build up that skill set because then you can begin to demonstrate that not only in your current position to potentially lift you up into a new role in the company but also potentially give you skill sets that you can project externally if you're looking to leave your current role. So you always, always, always need to grow and find inspiration outside of your typical working hour because that time is dedicated to client work, paid work, and not you, not you as a person. I agree. The only thing I'm gonna add, cause I mean, Marty and Alexis have said, have said it perfectly, um, the only thing I'm going to add is before you transition into UX, know your why. 
that's the only question I'm going to ask. Like, why do you want to transition into UX? Yes, it does pay well, but if you're in it for the money, you won't last because the job, is, it looks great and it looks all dandy and, you know, incredible on the outside, but this is like a battlefield. I mean, you're having to negotiate, you're having to defend your work, you're having to get buy-in and, you know, go against stakeholders and against your program managers or your director at some point. I mean, this, this is, it's not, you know, it's not um, all dandy. Like you need to be ready for, you know, to understand what this role uh, entails, right? So know your why, you have to have a passion for solving problems or a passion for creating experiences that are effective that are beautiful you know that whole um that whole uh, world needs to excite you from the inside out and then once you understand that once you believe and you know hey look i love solving problems and this industry is just perfect for who i am then that that's the beginning right and then now you can go in and then of course you're gonna have to practice you're gonna have to learn you're gonna have to um just really immerse yourself into the industry and that's really the way that you build up your your value build up your skills and your understanding to really uh, be able to dive in and then um, you know make a name for yourself the other thing though uh, in addition to what marty said about uh, working doing charity work and you know building for everybody and anybody i agree with that 100 percent and actually you can also build for startups as well. So you're doing charity work, which are real clients. And then you can also find some startups that will give you equity, startups that you believe in, right? So, because it's all about passion here, you know? So if you find a startup that's building something incredible that, you know, you, you, you find interesting or exciting, you can say, hey, look, you know, all right, I'm down to partner and they might give you some equity, um, you know, or they, you know, probably, um, Give you some equity and then you do that work for them they're a real client giving you real life experience uh, and then you might come out eventually with some crazy equity i mean uber and all these other companies started small so imagine if you're able to get in with a startup that you believe in uh, and do some work on the side for them while you while you look or while you transition or build or gain experience and then you can also do some charity work to give back to the community and the society and it's all practice because these guys are even though it's um it's not necessarily like a paid, a direct, you know, direct hire kind of job. They're still gonna give you the real life pain of um, designing, getting pushed back, and then reiterating. You know, that whole process. You're still gonna experience it in its fullness uh, to some degree, and I think that helps you uh, stay prepared or at least get a taste of what uh, the you know the job really is like out there, and then you can. Uh, keep working at it and you know we're, we're excited to have you in the industry and you know let's let's do this so that's all i have all right before jumping on to the next question i just wanted to make the announcement that we are going to have a raffle in about uh, five minutes and i just wanted to make sure that everyone who wants to participate to go ahead and uh fill out the 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 form that is on the chat right now okay um so I have another question here from the chat. Um, this one says, as I start my transition, this is from Dina Sophie, sorry. As I start my transition into UX design career, I like to know how often you hire junior designers so that I know how to target my job search. All the time, like, I, like broad statement. Um, it depends slash all the time. Um, so I run the and I run the internship program in the Austin studio um, for for Frog. That we have internship programs all over the globe as well. Um, but we also have level one designers, which are our junior roles. Um, so as a as a consultancy, there are a number of factors that come into posting any job rack. Um, number one, do, do we have enough people in that level that there's just no point in adding more people? So our Austin studio is only 80 people, so we can't just keep adding more and more individuals. But if we feel like we're very top heavy, like we have a bunch of seniors, then of course we want to hire ones and twos um, to, and interns to, to fill the breadth of that. And so our seniors can mentor the juniors, our juniors can grow in their career. Um, so for us, there are a number of questions we have to ask ourselves in terms of number of people, 
Um, do we have clients in the studio to actually be able to assign people to work, which would then afford us the opportunity to hire someone new to put them on that project? Um, and so if we can jump through those hoops, we can say, yes, we all of these things are aligning, let's open a rec, um, then we, we do that. Uh, for Frog, we These take paid internship positions um, and not un unpaid internship positions. Um, your, your time, energy, and actual work is, is more important than the exposure uh, that, that you're getting, so get paid for your services. Um, but yeah, so we have internships, we, we hire junior designers. Uh, I think we actually have open roles for our Mexico City studio right now, if you're interested in Mexico City at Frog. Um, at like a level one, a level two, and a senior. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask a, we, I think everyone got to answer that one. Um, real brief one, kind of a sort of a, it's an obvious answer that might go into your head when you hear this, but like complete the sentence, every designer should dot, dot, dot. Should be passionate about design. I'm going to, I'm going to say something more. Uh, I think every designer should know how to communicate their solution to other people quickly. Because if you can't do that, it's like an elevator pitch. You, you've got to be able to do whatever tool it is, whether it's a chart or a prototype or a sketch or a thumbnail or whatever it is, you've got to be able to, if you get the right person's attention, you've got to be able to communicate your solution to this problem and then get their feedback when you need to know iterate or whatever but i would think that that would be the one if i had to do one skill besides the obviously being passionate but something more um can what i would what i would need from you what i need from you every day if you came to work for me is your ability to communicate whatever your solution is as quickly as you can and I would just add, I think every designer needs to iterate and come up with multiple explorations before uh, deciding on the final solution. Thank you. <laughs> good. When I was 25, by the way, I was absolutely convinced that the first design I did all the time was absolutely beautiful. I was, I was absolutely sure. I, I, and I maintained that ridiculous attitude, probably well, way too far into my thirties but I was still the most fabulous thing. It was just my first idea. I would do sketches where you know, why, I mean, why am I iterating? And my creative directors would keep sending me back, bring me five more. Why? It's a waste of time. Now I do, now I just, I, oh my God, I've become that person. Now I send them back. Um, I, actually, I don't know if you want to ask one, Andrena, but there was a question earlier in the chat about, um, with COVID, somebody, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I have to go back to figure out who was asking. Um, oh, Joshua Bullock was asking, um, what are you doing in the midst of this uh, pandemic to actually interact with users and get out of the building is how they expressed it. I mean, what new techniques are you finding, if anything? So I can, I can jump in here. Um, so we, we do a lot of research at Frog um, and we do it ourselves. So we don't, we don't have our own research department and we don't hire out for it. Um, we have found ways to, to do that remotely. We use programs like Zoom or Teams or, or, um, or anything else, any other kind of online communication platform. We use other tools like Figma or Adobe XD if we have design assets that we want people to, to see. Um, we also use a program called Miro which is like a, a whiteboarding tool. So people can literally get in there and move stuff around and build dashboards or screens or, or journey maps with us. So we're using all of these types of online collaborative tools to maintain the consistency that we have in how we interview with individuals, um, as well as using these online collaborative tools to then synthesize all of our findings. So typically our synthesis in the past would have been on physical sticky notes. Um, and we just don't have that physicality right now to be able to do that with people in their homes. Um, so we've had to pivot pretty quickly, but uh, there are, you know, there are, are growing pains with that. 
Um, but there are also some really cool efficiencies allowing us to, to connect with people we might never have been able to connect to. Um, I would say it also still uh, forces us to have the questions around um, designing with, right, and accessibility and being able to connect with people who might not have access to solid internet connections um, or computers or anything else um, and how we can make sure that we still have conversations with those people and get those voices involved um, even if we can't connect with them in the ideal way that we we would prefer yes i would say it's just you know we've just adapted to uh remote research um tools and techniques and i think even prior to covid you know we were combining uh and when I say we, just in all my experiences, right, we've always combined uh, remote um, research, uh, you know, methods with on-site. If we can actually go there or set, you know, a moderated session up or something like that, we can do that in person. Great. But if we can't, um, then we'll have to just do something remote with, you know, Miro or Envision or Freehand or, you know, all these different remote tools that are uh, now available, Zoom, et cetera. So that's really the, um, the go-to for, for these COVID times, yeah. Yeah, we've gone to obviously the same tools as particularly, I'm a big mural fan. Um, although, uh, you know, in-car testing has kind of, that stopped. <laughs> and there's a point when you just have, to, for what we do, you just have to test in the car. And, and that's, even even the even even which is really cool. we have the simulators you know where you get in and you pretend you're driving and you flash but but they're in the office so that all came to a, an abrupt we haven't found a simulation for that yet <laughs> that sitting next to someone where they're driving the car and you're doing this stuff we haven't found a haven't found a workaround for that one yet Did marty uh, marty give frog a call and we'll set up like a vr, <laughs> you know, a VR situation for you <laughs> <laughs> i think we've already given you money <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plenty of quiet. <laughs> All right, guys. So we're nearing the um, the end. Um, so I just want to take a couple more questions from the chat so that people don't feel left out. Um, I've seen about four questions regarding UX research. So I wanted to ask you guys if you have any recommendations for someone who wants to focus more on UX. And this is from Angel Newball. So focus on UX or UX like research? UX research. Because that's something that, you know, it's not really discussed much. And so people that want to enter these fields feel a little left out because it's not spoken about as much. Um, so do you guys have any uh, insights on people who actually want to focus on that? Yeah, I mean, I would say- I admire you dramatically. I mean, I have at levels that I can't even get into. The, uh, the, um, I think one of the things for um, you know, having worked with some really outstanding UX researchers um, over the years is the, is their ability to be, uh, if you can objectively look at yourself, you know, the know thyself thing again, and know that you can not carry the bias in and not, um, bring your opinions into it when you're helping work with test plans. But more importantly, you have to deliver some really unfortunate, unpopular <laughs> information to people sometimes, stuff they don't necessarily want to hear. Uh, there's VPs who fall in love with their product and then you go out and say, I'm really sorry, but this sucks and no one's gonna buy it. And here's the 89.7% of people who said that. And you're gonna have to tell this person that who has the ability to fire you. So um, there's, a, I think you have to really look at yourself objectively and know, are you from a personality standpoint? And then obviously there's, a, there you can come to it from any field, but in particular, in what we do, because it's a business, I would say, make sure you're looking at yourself objectively and understanding that it's, it's um, can you truly be objective in a sea of people who are going to be trying everything possible to get you not to be? Yeah, I would also add that, you know, you still need to build a portfolio, just like someone who wants to do hands-on design, right? Like you need to communicate your worth and what your skill sets are to the, the companies that you want to, to interview at. 
So whether you are getting experience in qualitative methods versus quantitative versus validation, all of those are different aspects of research, all of which have a plethora of different methodologies behind them. And so you still need to be able to experiment and have projects that can walk them through your research methods, like why you chose it, what you did, who your subset of, in, of individuals were, what were the artifacts you created out of them, whether they're personas or archetypes or design principles, what the, the outline strategy is or the recommendation or the business metrics or anything else. There is still a process and a model of creation that you still need to make so people can understand what you would bring to the table as a researcher, whether you apply at like a, a Home Depot who might have an in-house research firm or whether you apply at a frog who is expecting you to be both hands-on with the work and do research, or whether you apply maybe at like a serious exam that has both something in-house plus maybe a third party um, that, that you can reach out to. If you're interested in literally just doing research, there are plenty of companies out there, both in Austin, Texas, and the nation, um, that are only research companies that big corporations will will bring in to do smaller subsets of testing So there is a way to dial just directly into that discipline um, But you need to build up your your broad skill set in that and show your worth just as you would if you were going to be a, a user experience designer Thank you. Um, I want to squeeze another question in here. It's again. It's I'm collapsing all these questions Which means I'm probably butchering them. So I apologize to people um, we had a bunch of people asking about um, favorite tools, um, prototyping tools, whiteboarding tools. Obviously, Adobe XD is awesome. I'm legally required to say that. Actually, I'm not. I'm just joking. Um, but I would like to, oh, I'm sorry. Did I, I just got a message. That I didn't let you answer, William, the previous question. Did you want to answer that first and I can save my question? No, I think, no, I think it's the same thing. You know, whether it's UX research, UI design, UX design, or any other specialty in the you know, experience design discipline, you do the same things that the visual designers are doing. You know, you're, you're studying, you're practicing, you're, you're doing all of the, you know, those things. You're getting um, experience, you know, internships and all of that, you know, doing charity work just to get that uh, real life experience. So everything that we've said, we've spoken to, uh, you know, um, works for you as well. It goes to the, the researcher. So just put that in practice, you know, the passion, all of that, because yeah, I mean, I don't like doing research either, but <laughs> you know, if, if that's something that you're passionate about, I'd say definitely dig deeper in, in there and, uh, you know, learn more and build, build that, um, that skill up. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So before we close up for the night and reveal tonight's winner for the raffle, I uh, just wanted to ask you if you had any final remarks in terms of what I, what you were doing, to keep your career future forward in the US industry? I'll just go. I was gonna say, so, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, uh, go back to the roots of human centered design because, you know, once you master that art of keeping the human perspective throughout your design process, then no matter the change in tools, the change in technology that uh, we are going to experience for the next, you know, for the rest of our lives, you are able to still design with that perspective because that really is the key. You know, there's conversation design now, you know, voice, UI, all of these different things happening now. And you have the, you know, automobiles and it's just, there's just gonna be a lot of different uh, interactions that, that would need design, right? But the user, seems to be a constant, which will be the humans. So once you can, you know, master and, and keep that perspective of that human centeredness, I think that will um, help keep your, your UX career future forward, in my opinion. And also, of course, keep practicing. Don't be afraid to learn new tools. Uh, always try to stay ahead of the game, you know, by uh, being connected in the community and uh, plugging in, networking, all that good stuff. So you can really be ahead and, and plugged in on what new tools are, uh, tools are happening, coming out, what new technology is being used, et cetera, you know. Um, but yeah, just uh, happy designing, that's all I got. Yeah, I think what I do um, is, honestly, this is gonna sound super corny, I'm sure, but um, it's, it's investing in, in y'all. Like it's doing stuff like this. I, I'm an adjunct professor, I mentor people, I work with 
meetups, I work with General Assembly, I work with Adobe XD. It, it's being able to see what makes y'all passionate to teach you the things that I know and have you question absolutely everything that grounds me and keeps me inspired to, to push forward and knowing that there are so many people still interested in solving the problems of today and tomorrow's world and being able to interact with you all is just, is what keeps me moving forward and is what keeps me as inspired as I am to 17 years later, still be doing this thing. I, uh, I left design school when I was 22. I'm now 61 and it's just as cool every single day when I get up in the morning. Um, I, they laugh because every time there's a new technology or new tool, like, oh my God, this is so cool. I have to have this right now. Like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, I, when I'm 61, I play Beat Saber. What, you know, that could look ridiculous. Um, but it's fun <laughs> and I have a great time and, and I don't care. And I'm, and that if, if, if every time you get up, you look at this new device and you go, my God, how does that work? How does this, how, what does it work? What does it do? And you're that intrigued and you start looking things up and you can't stop. That's how you're going to keep your career because you won't be able to prevent your career from going forward at that point. I truly don't believe it. I think that's where you'll just, you'll keep learning. And that's Frankie. I am not downstairs watching Netflix, just so you'll know. I have to... <laughs> I'm not in my spot. I'm not performing my user function for Frankie, which is to be a sofa for her to sit on. Um, the, uh, but those kind of, of, it won't be effort to stay on top. It sounds ridiculous. You keep learning and you keep you engage in the meetups and you do teaching at classes and you speak at events whenever you can. All, none of those things become work when you do this. And truly love it. And I, and I think, and the fact that you guys are here and now there's still three screens of you, <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. All of you. You'll be absolutely fine. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can see um, who wins the raffle for tonight. Are you able to see my screen? We can. Okay, so I put all of your names. 73 are the ones that enter. So let's go ahead and see who's the lucky winner. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> and we have, oh, oh, Veronica. Let's see, is Veronica here? Hi, can you guys Hi, hear me? Veronica. Congratulations! You are the lucky winner of a year of Creative Cloud, courtesy of Adobe. Wait, whoa! Like a whole year? A whole year. Oh my God! <laughs> You're so <That's> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, we got your information, so you'll receive all everything by email. And again, thank you so much for uh, being here tonight. Thank you to all our panelists and Kareem for also assisting us tonight. Everyone's so grabbing their cats. Well. Everyone's grabbing their cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the cats. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, um, I just want a, a significant other or a teddy bear or something. Yes. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also wanted to invite you all for our next meetup next month. It is going to be focusing on UX research. Um, as a career path. So a lot of the questions that you guys have tonight will be answered with a panelist full of researchers. Now. I hope to see um, a lot of you there. And thank you again for coming tonight for all your questions. And join our Facebook group and stay in touch. Thank you, everyone. Thank see you. Ya. Have a good night. Good night.